Alicia, we are back for yet another week of Trashy Divorces. Sunday on the Trashy Divorces Island, y'all. Welcome to Trashy Divorces. We cannot get enough of the summertime. Speak for yourself, but okay. For now. No, it'll all end after my birthday next week. Is Happy birthday. Which in which fall starts. Right. After my birthday next week, I'm done with summer and it's time for fall. Right. Unfortunately, summer is not done with us after your birthday, but you know, let's we'll cross our fingers on that. We can imagine. This week, our theme song, Coconut Telegraph, is from the master of all things summertime, Mr. Good Times himself, Mr. Jimmy Buffett. The song is Coconut Telegraph. It comes from Buffett's 10th studio release of the same name. As Buffett albums go, this one is a beauty. All of my pretty much favorite songs live on this album. Highly recommend. Five stars. Okay. Ten stars. All right. We are heading back down to the island to talk about two of the most scandalous divorces and lovely ladies of the Palm Beach set. It really was kind of a cool week. Who did you cover, Stacey? Marjorie Merriweather Post. Who you didn't know it was going to be an AP history lesson. No, I didn't. It was awesome, though. Like, I, I really was not familiar with her. And it was very cool to look at the 20th century through the lens of her really extraordinary life. So, yeah. And you have for us... Cult goddess of all sorority girls everywhere, Lily Pulitzer, and the not really very at all trashy, but really exciting story of her first divorce from Peter Pulitzer. Lots of money, rarefied earth, two really interesting individuals, and at the end of the day, I think a story about female friendship that will warm your heart. Yeah, I think that's true. And like, really, if you look at how women form businesses they they do tend to it's it really they really do follow an arc that i think most women entrepreneurs will be familiar with we had two interesting business ladies this week for sure it's kind of cool for sure before we get started let's do some quick business and some huge shout outs for the week y'all i do want to let you know we're now on pandora oh we are yeah so if that is your preferred way to stream podcasts, Trashy Divorces has got you there in addition to all of your favorite other podcatchers that we are aware of on planet Earth. Yeah. yeah. Even YouTube. You can find Trashy Divorces everywhere. We're on YouTube. Yeah. we've International and shit. Yeah, yeah. If you're trapped in an office and like, not, a, I don't know, like we're on YouTube as well. If you want to just have a tab open. Patreon. Oh, right. We was do hot, that hot, too. hot this week. <laughs> Trashy tidbits included a little background on exactly why we both support Brooke Shields' claim to be the Queen of France. To be clear, we don't think she's made that claim, but we would support her making that claim. We actually, we are Team Brooke, Queen of France. We are Team Brooke, Queen of France. We went down to the islands again this week, talked to little Jimmy Buffett and Sloppy Joes and Captain Tony Terracino. We had an important wedding announcement for a nice lady and her betrothed uh, Lumiere, the chandelier. Right. Not Chandler, Chandelier. Chandelier. Mm-hmm. We had a sad divorce of a lady and her ghost pirate husband yeah, that was as a, well. Was, that was rough, yeah. Oh, also on Fun with Done this Fune week. Fun I covered the monster that was Klaus von Bülow. That guy is and, a dick. Yeah. That guy's like, mm. His heiress wife, Sonny. Uh, Dominic Dunn style. Dominic we Dunn did the style. Mm-hmm. Fatal charm story. All kinds of good stuff is coming this week to the Patreon. I'm so excited for all of our new people who are right on time to catch up on all of our trash candy. Stacy, who have you got in the magic mirror this week? I have, and a big thank you to Courtney D, Peggy, Kate G, Sarah H, and Carol D. I can't believe you didn't sing. And Peggy. And Peggy. I should have lined that up better. Is there an Angelica on the list too? Because I know we've got an Eliza. No, but there is an Eliza. Uh, Allison M, Harley B, Farah W, Kim, Kelly C, Jessica, Eliza K. That what that was? Do it, Eliza. Okay, I think she's gotten enough shout outs. Probably um, Haley L, Jennifer S, Lisa W, Kristen D, Kimberly N, Heather D, Natalie N, Amara, Claire S, Mary R, Meredith S B. Haley T and Helen C. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon. We hope that you are loving it over there. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Team Trash Candy. I have two more names. You do. For the Magic Mirror this week, our friends Amanda and Jody. If all y'all listeners in the galaxy that are the 
trash can connections of our world. Have a spare 10 seconds this week, friends. Please send these two lovelies, Amanda and Jody, a little thought of love and light and peace this week from our trashy divorce family. Thanks, yep. y'all. I mean, we're not one to deal in gossip, but are you ready to hear those hotlines hum? I heard it on the Coconut Telegraph. Stacy, you ready to start this? Go, go, go. Woo! So, Stacy, you got some hot dish on the Coconut Telegraph this week. Um, on I... a Palm Beach's first and famous divorces. So I kind of have to thank you. You've been telling me really since this project began, probably months before we actually started recording this, that what I really needed to do was look into the woman who built Mar-a-Lago, which seemed to me like a stupid thing to do. Like, why would anyone? But indeed, I don't know why you doubt me. I finally have looked into the woman who built Mar-a-Lago. How'd it go? Her life was amazing. 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 And I had never heard this story before ever. I mean, she was like a paragon of the 20th century. Like a really, really amazing person. So this and is... And now we're bringing it all to our Trashy Divorces listeners. We are. So this is uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post. Lots of famous names in there. So I suspect I hadn't heard of, heard of her because she died just a few years before I was born at a very old age. So like her prime happened decades before my birth. Plus she was like so rich that I'm not sure... There's like, a level of rich that doesn't get written yeah. about quite as frequently as... Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is the life and times of businesswoman, philanthropist, socialite, and collector of fine art, Marjorie Merriweather Post. Everything in this story sounds amazing. Do okay, it. so first let's duck into a particular bit of American weirdness that swept the Midwest in the mid-19th century. So up in Battle Creek, Michigan, a guy named John Harvey Kellogg note the name, founded a health resort in 1866 that offered a lot of kooky ideas about human vitality. Kellogg pushed vegetarianism, frequent enemas, including yogurt enemas, and celibacy with an upsettingly focused view on preventing masturbation, especially in children. I'm not even as hung up on the celibacy as I am yogurt enemas. What? He he was, uh, like, I guess this started as he was Seventh-day Adventist, and I guess they have a very sort of pure dietary view and then i think he just went on from like the enemas thing i don't think is typical seventh day advent <laughs> you know that's yogurt with an h in it too yeah probably Go ahead. <laughs> probably 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 okay he was also not into alcohol or caffeine shockingly he basically you know the temperance league thing was a thing at this time but his when when he set up temperance leagues they included coffee and tea ah. it was booze coffee and tea and tobacco he want none of it anyway Eccentric guy, but super influential, very, very famous for several decades around this time. There were thousands of people who visited the Battle Creek Sanitarium every year. The most prominent people in the United States visited. I mean, it was like, it was a thing. It was a big, big deal. Line up now for your yogurt enemas. Yeah. And we're going to like cut off your kids' fingers if we catch them masturbating or something. I mean, it was really, it was brutal on that. Yeah, it, it was, it was super weird. One such patient was Charles William, or C.W. Post, who had suffered periodic nervous breakdowns from about 1885 on, and he finally found his way to the Battle Creek Sanitarium. He was inspired by Kellogg's teachings, so he began experimenting with various roasts and mixtures of wheat and molasses until he developed the beverage that would come to be known as Postum. Which the hell is Postum? You had never heard of Postum. When I was a kid, my parents kept Postum on hand because it's sort of coffee-ish, it doesn't taste like coffee, but it's, but it is a hot dark brown liquid. It's a little bit sweet. It's a, it's but it's caffeine free, which is how the Kellogg influence came into this mixture. When my brother and I, as very small children, were like envious of my parents' coffee drinking, they would mix us up some postum, and so we could have a similar drink, but would not be bouncing off the walls with a caffeine high at the huh. age of five or whatever. Okay. So postum. Postum. It is made from wheat berries, wheat bran, and molasses, and it's a caffeine-free alternative to coffee. And it turns out that Charles was an- it Sounds horrible. <laughs> Unless you're five. And it's better than you think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't had it in years, but- All right. So it turns out that Charles was an exemplary marketer, right? So 
he took this like brand new product, had this big advertising campaign, and he like he didn't initially go directly at the caffeine thing, but he had this weird tagline that was like, there's a reason or something. It was like, post them, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a reason. And then <laughs> people were like, well, what's the reason? And went and bought it. Okay. So, yeah. So two years later, he comes up with grape nuts. Sure. Still around. Later, um, he makes a version of Kellogg's cornflakes called Post Toasties, which John Kellogg was furious that this guy stole the cornflakes idea. <laughs> he, he was so mad. Anyway, soon the Postum Cereal Company was a multi million dollar operation, and young Marjorie, his daughter, who had been born in 1887, she grows up literally helping her dad grow his business. Like at night, oh, she's wow. out in the barn with him gluing postum labels onto jars. When she was a very old woman, she was like, I can still taste that glue. Oh my <laughs> I God. I can still, like I know, I know what that is. Dad was insistent that this business was going to stay in the family. So as she got a little older, he started having her come in for business meetings. She's probably like eight or 10 sitting in on business meetings. He sends her out to factories to learn all the processes in manufacturing. There, like he wants got her to be revolutionary for the time. Yeah. Yeah. He wants her to know everything about it. And also like this family now in Battle Creek, Michigan, they are newly rich. They are new money, but lots of money. So the parents decide like, well, we, you know, daughter's getting a little older. Let's send her to finishing school in Washington, D.C. to move into society to get some culture sure to become a thing culture i like the way you said that to deb out so she arrives she meets an aspiring lawyer from one of the founding families of greenwich connecticut edward bennett close and uh four days later he proposes marriage to her oh wow it is 1903 uh marjorie you know is elated writes home mom dad have a suitor. We're going to get married. And dad's like, no, no, no. Give it a couple. You cannot marry this boy you've known for four days. Like, no, no, no. So she agrees to hold off for a couple of years, probably till she's 18. He'll be done with law school. So then something very strange happens. What happens? In 1904, Marjorie's father, Charles, abandons her mother, Ella, divorces her and what? marries against her will to like, he just, he's out, marries his 27 year old secretary, <gasps> Layla. No, Layla. Layla. Oh, you okay. got me on oh, my grape nuts. Yeah. So Marjorie, for the rest of her life, says that her mother died of a broken heart. No. All right. So so Pops does something super fucked up in 1904. And in 1905, like like six or eight months after Dad's second wedding, Marjorie and Ed get married. Well, good for her. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, this was the perfect society wedding. Marjorie, at this point, is worth $2 million in her own right. And Ed has got his law degree from Columbia, comes from an extremely comfortable background himself. So the problem was that Ed was sort of civilized to a fault. And so there was like a story about they, they go down to Texas to visit some of her relatives. Her dad and, and Layla are along for the trip. They're like camping out with cowboys who are showing them parcels of land that Charles is thinking about buying. He's going to build a model community. Like, he's, he's, he's kind of a visionary guy. So they're camping out in, like, the Texas desert. And, and like, poor Ed, at one point, he was seen reaching into his gear and pulling out pink silk pajamas to put on. And then he sort of looks around the campfire and sees all the faces of the cowboys. And yeah, how he, do you think like, that's going to go in a circle of cowboys? Tucks them back into his... No. Yeah, he was just... He was... He's, he's a Yankee. I mean, he is a New England... Son of wealth. His rich, independently minded wife kind of chafed at some of his more traditionalist views, but it was young love, you know, and it's like good, good girls don't want to wait forever. Like there was a lot, was a lot of fun sure. happening <laughs> with these two. Um, but, you know, Ed was Episcopalian and shortly after the marriage, he demands that Marjorie leave her Christian science faith and become Episcopalian too. And she's like, fuck you, dude. Like, I don't have to. You knew what I was when you married me. Like, yeah. It seems like she kind of fell for him because he was a very stable guy while her dad was kind of less so. Not. Not. Uh, but as the years went by, I think that just sort of turned into boring to her, you know. So they had two daughters, Adelaide and Eleanor, and they traveled quite a bit. But at, at heart, like, I think Ed just thought he was 
going to have a, a Greenwich housewife while he went off and practiced law. He became a stockbroker later. This is like, a kid who was learning a business at eight years old. She's never going to be that's, typical. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. So then, more tragedy, in 1914, uh, her father commits suicide. Mm. Um, there are rumors maybe that Layla, that he had discovered Layla was having an affair. She apparently remarried almost immediately after his death. Yikes. Yeah. So tragedy, tragedy. However... Marjorie is suddenly the owner of the family business, Postum Cereal Company. Wow. Um, she's 27 years old, and her net worth is more than $200 million. Holy cats. Mm-hmm. In what year? 1914. That is a lot of that grape nuts. a lot of grape nuts. And like, I don't even know what that would be in today's dollars, but I'm guessing several billions. Billion. Yeah. yeah, billions. Okay, so war breaks out in 1917, as it does, and uh, Ed goes off to fight you know like uh, he may have been a jag lawyer i don't know does but, he take uh, his pink pajamas undoubtedly um <laughs> marjorie donates cash and supplies to the war effort she once sends a ship full of hospital equipment headed for france but the ship sinks so she hires another one fills it full of the same stuff and sends it off again like the whole thing including the lost ship and cargo um she spends one hundred and fifty thousand dollars getting this stuff to wow france. Meanwhile, she's spending her days rich and alone in New York City, roving in the elite social circles there, supporting museums, taking classes in art history, which is just a lifelong thing that she develops. She loves, loves art and architecture. So when Ed comes back from the war, 1919, they're just really different people, sure. right? She files, from, she files for divorce from him. It's been 14 years, oh, two wow. daughters. Um, he goes on to marry again. I mean, they both do, as you'll hear. This is just husband number one of four. Through his next wife, Edward Bennett Close is the paternal grandfather of the actress Glenn Close. No way. Way. Crazy pain. All of these all of these figures are like Mar- oh. Marjorie Merriweather Post. It's a spider web. Yeah. She, by intention and happenstance, just ends up spider webbed to everything, everything. All right, one husband down, three husbands to go. Edward Francis Hutton, E.F. Hutton. He was a New York City boy. Everybody's listening. Was that his? When E.F. Hutton talks, well, yeah, everybody, everybody listens. listens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, E.F. Hutton was a New York City boy, born in Manhattan and largely raised by his mother, apparently in very, very dire circumstances after his father died when he was, I think, 10. In 1904, when he was 29 years old, he and his brother Franklin Laws Hutton, Franklin being the husband of Edna Woolworth. Jeez. <clears throat> oh, and the father of Barbara Hutton. Oh, my. <laughs> they found um, E.F. Hutton & Co., a stock brokerage that would go on and be one of the leading sure. stock brokerages in America. Marjorie had met E.F. Hutton and his wife Blanche, as well as Franklin, at, like at a party or something during the war. She runs into him again in 1919 while she's in Palm Beach and is stunned to learn that Blanche, uh, who he had been married to for about 18 years, had died in the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. Oh, wow. I mean, this story really has like a little bit of everything from all of these eras. So anyway, so yeah, Blanche Hutton dies. The next year, uh, Marjorie runs into EF. He is already legendary. And Marjorie was beautiful, cultured, rich, and newly single. She was 32. He was 44. He was brilliant, charming, and movie star handsome. Match made in heaven. They were both done for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> done for, sure. for. So in 1920, they get married, and they lived the real-life Gatsby fantasy of the 1920s. They had a 54-room apartment in New York City. What? I think it was a. I think they combined three townhouses or something. 54 rooms, 54 rooms. in New York City. Holy fuck. They have a. They had a 329-acre estate on Long Island's North Shore called Hillwood. That is currently the campus of Long Island University's Post Campus. Really? Mm-hmm. Topridge Camp in upstate New York is one of the great camps of the Adirondacks. Marjorie is said to have considered Topridge to be her rustic retreat. It sat on 207 acres and had 68 buildings, including a fully staffed main lodge and private guest cabins, each of which came with its own butler. Oh. Topridge was only accessible by water, meaning that guests arrived on Marjorie's yacht. Well, Natch, come on. How else would you want to get there? Sure, but then a cable car system hauled them up the hill to the main building. Super rustic. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. 
Okay. Another thing that Marjorie and EF shared was a passion for business. They both just loved it. It was where their creativity sparked. It was, it was their thing. Uh, in 1922, EF oversaw the transition of Postum Serial from a private company to a public one, an early IPO. Oh, wow. So Marjorie retained majority interest in the company, but picked up a cool $10 million for releasing the remaining shares. Headquarters was moved from Battle Creek to Manhattan. Okay. They hobnobbed with old money and the new celebrity class, rubbing shoulders with Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Thomas J. Watson of IBM, and international figures like, wait for it... Lord Louis Mountbatten. <clears throat> Charles. This story has everything. It kind of has everything. So they bought property. They visited places they enjoyed. Uh, EF had a shooting lodge in South Carolina. And, of course, Palm Beach, which they both loved and also where they had met. And this was already a playground for the rich at the time. Oh, for sure. So they had a daughter. She became the actress Dina Merrill. And EF became chairman of Postum Serials. With the two of them running the show, the company expanded significantly. It bought Jell-O in 1925. They buy Baker's Chocolate in 1927. They buy Maxwell House in 1928. And this is the most important thing they do. Marjorie becomes aware of Clarence Birdseye's inventions around frozen food. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And she is like, EF. She calls him Ned. Ned, because her first husband was Ed. That's not confusing at all. Right. So Ned, Ned. Ned, Ned, we have to buy the Bird's Eye Company. Ned, Ned, sure. this is the future. Ned, Ned. It so sure finally, as fuck was the future. Yeah, finally he gives in and they purchase uh, Clarence Bird's Eye's General Foods Company. And Bird's Eye kept working. He was involved in this for years right. to come. Okay, so after this, they changed the name of the company from Postum Cereal to the General Foods Corporation, which was a much more fitting moniker for this like for sure. behemoth food conglomerate that they're building. Meanwhile, Marjorie is shopping for land around Palm Beach because she has a dream. To have a little country house? To have a little... On a, the beach? A little, a little, a little house. seaside cottage. That's mm, nice. Tiny little, little comfortable, intimate. That's super nice. She ultimately discovers a 17-acre parcel between Lake Worth and the Atlantic Ocean, and she begins a two-plus-year construction process on Mar-a-Lago, which means seed a lake. Because it covers both sides of... Because, yeah, it's between... Mm-hmm. Lake Worth and Lake Worth. the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, 600 craftsmen were involved in making this happen. Wow. Over two plus years. 1927, construction is completed at an all-in cost of $7 million. Mm. $90 million in today's moolah. Wow. The number of rooms in the home when it was completed seems to be in some dispute, but we'll just go with Wikipedia, which says it had 58 bedrooms, 33 bathrooms, a 29-foot-long marble-top dining table... 12, wow. Yeah. 12 fireplaces and, just in case, three bomb shelters. Because, you, A, you need that many fireplaces in Palm Beach. In Florida. Beach. <laughs> bomb shelters I'm down with. I'm cool with that. But yeah, 29 fireplaces in Palm Beach seems like a extravagant waste of fireplaces. It, it seems, yeah, a dozen fireplaces to... Uh, Mar-a-Lago was her very favorite place to entertain in the years that followed. So you sent me... Some you sent me a bit of a Vanity Fair article from. Oh, it's a beautiful. I think like, the early two thousands. Art Nouveau design. Like tell tell everybody, it's amazing. All right. Well, I I really just pulled the quote from uh, the guy that worked at it. So Tony Senecal. This is a quote from him. Mrs. Post spent six weeks a year here, says Tony Senecal, who started out as a footman at Mar-a-Lago in 1959 and now manages the place for Donald Trump. She had dinner parties almost nightly, and hers were the best because if there were 36 people, there were 36 people to wait on them, one footman behind each chair. In the 30s and 40s, there were a lot of black tie parties, and in the 50s, there were still some, but her friends were starting to die off at that point. On Tuesday night, she had square dancing, and everybody knew you had to come to the square dances if you wanted to be invited to anything else, but no blue jeans. There have never been any jeans on the property. Wow. I'm sure that's true to this day. No, they serve ketchup in the bottle and not a dish. It's well, not true. I'm certain there are blue jeans floating around Mar-a-Lago because let's let good things go to die. Okay. No, Zigfield Follies, one of their set designers, created that home. It's Spanish Moroccan style. It is. It was a show palace. It was a show palace. Dina Merrill, uh, her daughter with E.F. Hutton, important to note that the Merrill and her stage name was Merrill Lynch, like Charles Merrill of Merrill. Like, oh, wow. What kind of message is that sending? Yeah, I'm guessing because, I mean, they their marriage didn't work out either. 
So I'm, I'm guessing that maybe Dina had some feelings. A little slight about pun in dad. that. Yeah, huh. yeah, a little pokey poke. Um, she says, <laughs> uh, I was brought down here when I was two, recalls the actress Dina Merrill, Marjorie Merriweather Post's daughter, sitting in her condominium apartment near the Breakers. I grew up here and went to Palm Beach Private School. They would bring us to the bath and tennis at 11 o'clock in the morning where we had swimming lessons and orange on a stick, which I assume is an orange on a stick. Or is it a popsicle? I, I'm not sure. Are we not rich enough to know these things? I don't think we're rich enough to know these things. All right. Then we'd go back to school till three. In those days, they had rattan chairs for two people with a man on a bicycle behind them. Huh. I'm just the look I'm giving you. I just, I would like that That's preserve for That's some rare earth, y'all. Before Mother died in 1973, Merrill continues, she wanted to leave Mar-a-Lago to the government to use as a winter White House. Nixon was about to take it. He was thrilled. But then Watergate happened. Then we got Ford, who liked to ski, so he didn't want to come down here. After that was Carter. Well, Ms. Lillian in Mar-a-Lago? I don't think so. Just before Reagan came in, it was given back to us without any notice. So now what were, what were we going to do? Trump was the only one who came up with any cash. Merrill has not set foot in Mar-a-Lago since it was bought 19 years ago by Donald Trump for a bargain price of less than $10 million. After she opposed his converting it into a club, he described her in his 1997 book as having been, quote, born with her mother's beauty, but not her brains. Oh. Okay, sorry for that rude intrusion by the No, this the week's Patreon machine. is going to have a lot to say about how Palm Beach felt about Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Also, how he how he got the price down when he decided to make his entree into society. Yeah. OK. So anyway, rude guy. Rude things to say. Sorry. Uh, I guess we all know what followed the Roaring Twenties. And that was the Great Fucking Depression, which sure. I think most people did not find that great. Plenty of people in Marjorie's world took a huge hit when the economy collapsed in 29. But even so, people got to eat. And Marjorie Merriweather Post owned perhaps the biggest food conglomerate of the era. So her fortune was secure. She did what she could to help, though. Uh, realizing that New York City's soup kitchens, which were frequently outdoor affairs patronized mostly by men, did not necessarily create a safe and civilized place for women and children to also congregate for meals, she created the Marjorie Post Hutton Canteen in Hell's Kitchen. Really? Mm -hmm. So not only did this give women and children an indoor soup kitchen where they could eat, but it featured tablecloths, linens, place settings, bouquets of flowers, and multi-course meals that were served by white-coated waiters who Whoa. were yeah, who were also down on their luck victims of the economy earning a paycheck. I mean, it really like she full circle. She really did what she could to to like use this to materially benefit the people in the community. The canteen operated from 1930 to 1935, and it seems that Marjorie was like genuinely affected by the misery that she saw during the Depression. So in 32, she attends the Democratic National Convention for the first time and becomes a big backer of FDR. Like, oh, wow. All in. All in. All in for FDR, like financially, like she's raising money for him. But consider- This is wealthy people using their money for good. Well, sure, but think about who her husband is. Sure. Wall Street guy extraordinaire. I mean, this guy defined what it meant to be a Wall Street guy. He was not on board with Roosevelt's vision of a vigorously active federal government that would solve problems and help people. Oh, that's so surprising. And I think... <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, where are you? <laughs> right. Um, I think Marjorie's political awakening in the face of just the incredible distress of the Depression kind of soured things between them. Like, at some point, he was using General Foods Corporation to lobby against Roosevelt's The New Deal. Oh, that can't have made Marjorie happy. No. Uh, there were other problems, though. Oh, no. Namely, that Mr. Ned Hutton was a cheater. Oh. And uh, that Mr. Ned Hutton had gone so far as to pursue Marjorie's live-in French maid. What? Yeah, I'm not sure if they actually had an affair or if he just was upsettingly creepy with her. But anyway, um, by 1935... I mean, that's not even trying to cheat. That's walking down the hallway. Mm -hmm. Come on, Which, man. Right. Come on. Okay, so by 1935, she knew for certain that she wanted a divorce in New York in order to shame and humiliate him where he lived. Beautiful. Right? But at the time, the only way to obtain a divorce in New York was to prove adultery. Mm. And this isn't like, I know my husband is having, like, you have to build, like, a criminal case against your spouse in order to, like, you're, you're proving she's the prosecution, basically, in her divorce. So she comes up with incredibly elaborate traps to, like, catch him in the act. She's got bells on doors. She's got, like, very fine silk threads that will... Break if he, you know, walks through or opens a door. Oh, yeah. 
she's got talcum powder on the floor to map his footprints. Double O Marjorie. She I love it. Is into it. And, you know, by the end, he like he denied furiously that he'd had any affairs. But his own valet and another maid in her house are both called to testify. And by the end of it, the judge is like, no, sir. No, sir. You are Let's not. Give this lady a divorce. Yeah. The New York papers, not like it wasn't known why they were splitting up until they had until it was done. And then the New York papers were like, oh, my God, E.F. Hutton is like cheating on his wife all the time. <laughs> Wow. (laughs) So um, she achieved what she wanted to. Like, he was humiliated at home. She was single. He was, by then, 60 years old. The following year, he remarried a (gasps) 28-year-old. What? And they stayed married until he died in uh, the 60s, I think. Boom. Holy cow. Husband number two, Finito. Although biographers do say that Hutton was probably like the love of her life of all of her husbands. Who just couldn't keep his penis in his pants. Basically. Wow. Basically. Uh, She finally takes full control of her company and all of the properties that she owns. And this was new. She claims a seat on the board of directors, which had always been denied to her earlier because when she was in the womb, she chose to be a girl and not a boy. Poor decision making. But Poor now now making. she's in her 40s or 50s or maybe like early 50s at this point. Well, enough money to your time divorcee. You don't get to tell me how to. Yeah. 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 Like I've expanded this company. I got this. Yeah. I've been putting puppets up to run the thing, but done with puppets. Well, for Marjorie Merriweather Post, hope springs eternal. Aww. So later in 1935, she marries lawyer and diplomat Joseph Davies, who is another Roosevelt stalwart, but he's been active in diplomacy since Woodrow Wilson. Like, okay, he's, he's the real deal. It was this marriage that led the reigning queen of New York City and Palm Beach High Society to conquer Washington, D.C.'s social strata. The dinners and parties she threw as Mrs. Davies apparently lent a luster to D.C. that had previously been missing an absence that she considered unbecoming for the capital of a great nation. Well, why not make it a triumvirate? Let's rule the social strata everywhere Everywhere. I go. Okay. Oh, it gets better. Oh. In 1936, and again, these two people have raised a lot of money for FDR. Like, they've been huge FDR backers. So FDR appoints uh, Davies. Is this our first instance of politics breaking up a marriage, I wonder? We can cut that. That's not. I, yeah. Sorry. I don't know. Um, okay. So in '36, FDR appoints Davies as the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, which oh, at, wow. at that time was being run by Joseph Stalin. Sure. Uh, if you don't know, Stalin is a complete and abject monster who killed bit. millions of people. Upon the appointment, that's kind of a tough gig. Less than you'd think, though, really? for Davies, who apparently was just a commie simp. That's a communist sympathizer for people who aren't old. Uh, yeah, it was weird. So, like, they jump on Marjorie's giant yacht and set sail for St. Petersburg. But you've got this strange situation where, like, Marjorie has had, it, it looks like a big political awakening as a result of the Depression. They get to the Soviet Union, and Davies is aware of how brutal Stalin is. But he keeps sending these, like, super optimistic cables home, like... Everything's fine. Everybody's really happy here. The, communism is no threat. Um, the we should be friends with the Soviet Union. Like Stalin's uh, a puppy dog. Yeah. Like just scratch him under <laughs> the You know, like just because you often hear Joseph Stalin just described as a puppy dog. He's yeah. like a little Yorkie. No, I made that one up, but <laughs> but like it was it was a strangely I don't know. It was it just seems strange. Like she was so affected by all of this suffering, and then they go to a country that. Its government is imposing suffering. And her husband is all like, no, this is great. Look around. (laughs) It's crazy. Okay. So a little weird tangent. Uh, Marjorie's love of art and Stalin's need for cash to prop up his government created a rare opportunity. Stalin wanted to sell off many of the treasures that the communists had expropriated from the Romanovs and other notable Russian families and institutions. And Marjorie was filthy Uh fucking rich. Oh. So she buys up in a two-year period what would become the largest collection of Russian art outside of Russia. Why? Including tapestries, Fabergé pieces, porcelain flatware that had been used by Catherine the Great. Oh, my God. Religious arts and icons, furniture, architectural pieces. Like, Whoa. like Stalin just had storehouses of all of this shit that... She just walked he, in and shopped. Basically, yeah. Oh, my God. 
So Wikipedia says that there is some dissatisfaction among Russians today with the fact that this material is in the United States. This stuff was literally stolen by an unelected government. And I suspect that a lot of the arguments that are accepted about art stolen by the Nazis in World War II probably applies here as well. Sure. By the same token, like they did not steal the stuff and the purchases were lawful. Right. Like, so it's anyway. There's provenance. There's a receipt. Yeah. But still. Yeah. I mean, let's just. Let's just go back to Stalin was a total monster who killed millions of people and just... He Puppy just, dog from hell. Just devastated his country. Okay. They returned to D.C. ahead of the outbreak of hostilities in Europe, but Davies played a significant role in diplomacy during the war, including shuttling a secret letter from FDR to Stalin so they could schedule a meeting for the two of them to talk. Because, like, the U.S. And, and the Soviets were allies against the Nazis. At one point, yes. Against the Nazis. Yes. <laughs> It was a very limited... Welcome again to your AP history class brought to you by Trashy Divorces. It's a limited engagement of friendliness between the U.S. and Joseph Stalin. Davies was a U.S. ambassador at the Potsdam Conference, and it appeared that uh, Marjorie just truly loved entertaining in D.C. But as the years went by, she got tired of his communist leanings, and he apparently had a pretty bleak attitude about the world and was kind of short-tempered. So in 1955, she got a quickie divorce from him, perhaps in Nevada. Oh. Nevada. I forget how to properly pronounce that state, that exotic locale. Um, Davies dies at his home in D.C. in 1958. Never, okay. never remarried, but okay. he, was only, he only lived a few more years. That's three. Three up, three down. Last husband. Yikes. The year is 1958, and the man is Herbert A. May a dashing businessman from Philadelphia who had aged into an elegant silver fox. They maintained residences in D.C., hers, and Pittsburgh, his, and commuted between cities. She had heard rumors for years that he was bisexual or homosexual, but seems to have written them off. After all, he had three kids from a previous marriage and was simply delightful to be around. He's like a these silver two, fox! They had, so, he loved to dance. He loved entertaining as much as she loved entertaining. Apparently they had a, like, daily sex life. <laughs> Was like he complained to friends about she's in her seventies. How can she want this much sex? What? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, okay. Over time, Herb and Marjorie's kids began to worry that Marjorie's social secretary was becoming sort of too powerful a figure because, again, Marjorie is like one of the most famous. She's one of the richest women alive. Sure. And she's super well connected. And so the social secretary like dined at her table like. I think they just felt like, eh, maybe, you know, just, I don't know, uh, a little too much gatekeeping on the part of this one person. So Herb kind of has a conversation where he criticizes the social secretary. And a few weeks later, a bundle of photographs of Herb cavorting naked with younger men at the <gasps> Mar-a-Lago pool no. lands, lands on Marjorie's desk. Yikes. The couple divorced. That'll do it. <laughs> in 1964. <laughs> Uh, it was her shortest marriage by far, like five, six years, but she remained very warm with Herb and uh, he had a stroke not long after the divorce. She paid his medical bills, made sure he had an apartment. She stayed very close to his children. He died in Fort Lauderdale in 68. Marjorie herself died in 1973 at the ripe old age of 86. The company that she had inherited from her father and built into a massive conglomerate was purchased by Philip Morris in 85 and then merged into Kraft Foods in 89. Oh, wow. Resulting in the Kraft General Foods division. In 07, Kraft spun off Post Cereals. It is the third largest breakfast cereal company in the United States. As for Postum, the caffeine-free grain-based beverage that started it all, Kraft discontinued production in 07, but demand remained, especially among Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists. In 2012, a North Carolina company called Eliza's Quest Foods purchased the trademark and trade secret for Postum from Kraft and has been selling it online and in select grocery stores. No way. In some parts of the U.S. and Canada since 2013. Do we need to get you some Postum, Stacey? It's on Amazon. You don't know how close I've come to ordering it. Oh, just order it already. <laughs> I wonder what it mixes with. Tequila? Hmm. Gin? Oh, we hadn't even thought about Postum cocktails. I bet. Have you met your wife? I mean, again, I haven't had it since I was a kid, but it may be the kind of thing that, like, on a cold night, like, a little bit of bourbon in there might be Post nice. yum is, post, I think, what you mean. Post yum. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post. That was an American history lesson. Who 
That's crazy. Built Mar-a-Lago and cable cars in the Adirondacks. <laughs> Just what a weirdo. Like, wow. cool, super cool. I mean, um, I would personally like to thank our cats who have been so well behaved this entire experience. Uh, this is going to be hell to edit. <sighs> Let's take a break. Let's take a break. We'll lock up some cats. Yes. They've been fed. They've been watered. I don't know what I their damage is. I clean their litter is. boxes. I, we do the things we can do. Yes, we this can. is why we don't have nice things. And we'll be back. So, Alicia, we have a live show coming up. Would you like to share some details? We do. We have a live show August 25th with Erica Kelly from Southern Fried True Crime. There are a handful of tickets left, y'all. If you're in Atlanta or the Southeast area and want to get your trash candy on, your true crime trash candy on, your Southern Fried Trash Candy on, you can head on over to vinkmans.com or even our website. We have a link to Mm -hmm. tickets there. And that's V-E-N-K-M-A-N-S.com. Get ready. Month countdown on Um, August 25th. Let's do it. We hope to see you there. So, Alicia, who are you bringing to us from the islands today on this lovely summer episode of Trashy Divorces? Palm Beach businesswoman, heroine, bravado goddess, Lily Pulitzer. Huh. And her divorce from her first husband, Peter Pulitzer. I'm going to go ahead and emphasize Pulitzer. It's Pulitzer, not Pulitzer. Oh, interesting. Just a little bit of a pronunciation magic there for y'all. And when did she create that prize for writing? <laughs> You're a funny girl. <laughs> and was it Peter Pulitzer who did? Like, who who created that? Are cool. you going to get into that? Cool your jets. Put your butt on a jet ski and go cool it in Lake Worth. Sometimes I think this is an interview podcast and I'm supposed to be interviewing you. No. Can you tell? Got you, boo. (laughs) So I first heard the name Lily Pulitzer in the bathroom reading a book that happened to be around our home in the early 1980s, The Official Preppy Handbook, Hmm. edited by Lisa Bernbach. This book was a staple of the early 1980s tongue-in-cheek humor about prep dumb and the preppy movement and it was lovely it was all the rage it might not have been totally appropriate for an eight-year-old but nonetheless i was hooked bathroom reading though i mean all kinds of things ended up in my childhood bathroom that's like, ex- mm-hmm. the official preppy handbook was the yeah we family had, bathroom reading yeah we had like pilot magazines in and, the downstairs um, bathroom forever and louis grizzard i still have that copy oh i, I Mom and dad, I have your copy of the official preppy handbook. I don't know if you know. Okay. So you might know of both of our divorcees in the story today from very different ways. Pulitzer is going to be familiar because of, you know, the Pulitzer Prize. And if you're into fashion or bright prints or into vintage or are a Delta Gamma or one of my Panhellenic sisters, if you ever had anything to do with a sorority, you've heard of Lily Pulitzer. You might have thought she only made those shift dresses. Well, I got a story for you today. This story was a lot of fun to research and maddening too. I am a certified expert in family trees and Plantagenet and Tudor England. True. But the American high society structure of the late 1900s to current day will make your head spin. That also seems that like that's what I was finding writing my story. Well, There's it's the Astor Mala, Ballroom. Like, mm-hmm. It's the 400, the 500 in Palm yes. Beach. They have a 300. Like it's nutballs. Yes. Okay. But and today. The, and the war in the 20s blew all those hundreds up. Like the, yeah. Like, I mean, crazy. crazy. Mm-hmm. So today we're looking at two crazy kids with a lot of inherited wealth. But also both kind of free gypsy spirits who found a way to make their own wealth too. Hmm. And got divorced in the process, which is how we tie it all in. Let's talk about Peter. Herbert Peter Pulitzer, who will be known as Peter. He went by Peter Jr. in this story. If it was between Herbert and Peter, yes, I would be Peter. Herbie. Twice twice a day on Sunday. He's born March 22nd. He is an Aries. But he's also right on the cusp. So Pisces Aries. Okay. He was the son of Herbert Pulitzer, known as Tony, and Gladys Munn. His maternal grandparents were Charles and Carrie Munn. The Munn name is a big deal in the land of high society. But his paternal family, their name is kind of big too. His paternal grandfather 
is newspaperman Joseph Pulitzer. Yes, the founder of the prize. His paternal grandmother is Catherine Davis, a descendant of Jefferson Davis and from a pretty high society name herself in D.C. No lack of pedigree or society credentials anywhere in this story. Yeah. So like most children of wealthy parents in the Palm Beach set, little Peter was raised mostly by nannies. He did go off to St. Mark's in Southborough, Massachusetts. He graduated handsome, athletic, charming, and undeniably cocky. Because not only have you got a shit ton of cash, you're fucking good looking and charming to boot. He heads off, like most kids from St. Mark's, heads off to the Ivy League. But college, like, just wasn't his thing. So instead, he takes $500,000 of his family money and decides to entrepreneur himself up. Hmm. He buys a liquor store. Because legit, solid money in a liquor store. What year was this-ish? What, what like era? 1949. Okay, so it's not like, and then Prohibition. <laughs> no, he was born okay. in 1930. So gotcha. okay. post high school, this is 1948, or okay. so, 1948, 1949. So yeah, this isn't the story of rich people Pratt Falls. This is, he buys a liquor store because people get a drink. No, this is liquor verifiably is a great way to make some I cash. Mean, okay. I think our liquor store believes that to be true. <laughs> True that. Peter Pulitzer will eventually end up expanding this half a million dollar investment to include citrus groves, cattle ranches, a Palm Beach restaurant, lots of real estate, and hotels. Does great for himself. But let's back up a bit. Super handsome, cocky, Pisces, Aries player. Right. With a lot of cash. A lot of cash. And a lot of hustle. Mm -hmm. He's described by Peter Dushin. He was racy. I mean, in the sense of just jumping into his plane and flying off, he eschewed the normal social crap. Hmm. Lily, uh, her friend and business partner, Laura Clark, says about Peter that he was very beautiful to look at with great personal charm, the kind of charm that you knew he was waiting all his life just to talk to you. Oh, one of those. He's one mm, of those, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, smooth. Those people can't help but be successful, basically. I mean, charmers. That's Bill Clinton, that, right? I mean, say what you will, but the man can do no wrong, apparently, except like all the wrong he does. <laughs> Charisma's a thing. Yeah. Okay. So you can see how some gal is going to fall hard and fast for mm-hmm. this charismatic, oh, sure. oh, yeah. dashing, okay. A beautiful, rich man with a, an amazing personality. <laughs> enter <laughs> hard to believe. Enter Lillian Lee McKim, born November 10th. She is a Scorpio. When interviewed by Vanity Fair in 2003, Lily identifies herself. Some of her friends call her a sphinx, like she keeps things inside. Lily herself says, no, I call myself a Scorpio. They do everything in excess, but keep things very close to the chest. I'm not into horoscopes and all that, but it is telling. Scorpios hold everything in. This reminds me so much of the quote by Zelda Fitzgerald that when she's talking about flappers, that you can tell exactly what they think, but they do all of their feeling alone. Hmm. That's Lily Pulitzer. Lily is a middle child. Her father is Robert McKim, a dude with a lot of cash. Her mom's family is even richer. Lillian Bostwick is her name. They're both old line families, but Lillian's grandfather, Jabez Bostwick, helps create the Standard Oil Company. Oh, oh that old thing. Lily's mom is that kind of rich. Gotcha, yeah. The McKims are rich. Mm -hmm. The Bostics are richer. So when Lily is six, her parents divorce. Some say the money difference between the families, like dad just couldn't deal, was the cause of the divorce. But you might also want to know that mom remarries pretty much immediately to a dude named Ogden Phipps, the son of Henry Carnegie Phipps. Yes, that Carnegie Ogden's grandfather, Henry, is the second largest shareholder in Carnegie Steel. Okay. And is that P-H-I-P-P-S, like the mall in Atlanta? Phipps. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like the very upscale mall in this Atlanta. This is the Mary Astor's 400. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. It, okay. okay. Just double checking. So Ogden Phipps, the new stepdad, his mother's side is as equally as moneyed. Like researching this is a very, very expensive and well-connected rabbit hole. It is also said that Lillian, 
having fallen in love with Ogden Phipps, who not only has a shit ton of money, but is a racing legend, Hmm. paid Robert McKim $1 million for a divorce. Some people say that. Some people say it was a lot more than that. Oh, Anyway, okay. I digress. Mom pays to get out of her shit marriage and marry the love of her life, who they do remain married. Mom remarries. Her new stepdad is not only a stockbroker, but also a champion on the tennis court. He's in the International Tennis Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can't. Yeah, no. I, it is a well-researched and moneyed rabbit hole. Yeah. There are oh, and, tapestries yeah, no, on know. the wall. All of these, and, yeah, all right. of these people are high achieving in whatever they choose to do. Lily's childhood is stable and affluent. She has two more siblings to follow. But y'all, it's high society. There are Monet's and John Singer Sargent's on the wall just in the living room. There are horses and boarding schools. Uh, Ogden Phipps is also a thoroughbred horse racing champion farm person. Sure. So Lily attends the best schools, including Chapin and Miss Porter's, which we've talked about before. Lily is at Miss Porter's in the years in between the Bouvier sisters, Jacqueline sure. and Lee, who you will know as Jackie Kennedy and Lee Residuel. Lily graduates from Miss Porter's in 1949, heads to college. But we're going to see this over and over. Lily kind of breaks the mold. Very much like Peter, she goes for two months and can't stand it. She doesn't know what she wants to do, but it is not a formal education. So instead, she goes and works as a nurse's aide in Kentucky and at a veterans hospital in the Bronx. These are surprising choices. I would have thought Instagram influencer or something along those lines. (laughs) (laughs) A little early for that. We just started working on the cable car. Give (laughs) us a minute. Okay. One of Lily's longtime friends, Catherine Livingston, wrote in her book, Lily, Palm Beach, Tropical Glamour and the Birth of a Fashion Legend. She writes about Lily in this time. She would frequently ride a mule or a horse through the woodsy Kentucky hills, delivering medicine and supplies to needy mothers and newborn babies in remote outposts. Sometimes Lily would be asked to lend a hand in home births. Other times she'd served as an assistant nursewife in the delivery room of the Mary Breckenridge Hospital, which had just been built at the top of Thousand Sticks Mountain by the time Lily arrived in 1949. Thousand Sticks Mountain? Yep. Love it. Can't make it up. But even though you're doing all the good deeds and mm-hmm. you like to help people, yep. family's got a vacation. And both the Phipps family, now that Lily's mom has married into, and the Pulitzer family take their vacations in a little island called Palm Beach. And here Lily and Peter meet in 1950. Lily is a friend of Peter's sister, who also went to Miss Porter's. And here Peter finds a gal from an equally moneyed family who also doesn't like to play by the rules. Yeah. And true love or something like that is born. They are done for. (laughs) Well, until they're not. So let's talk about First, a Pisces-Scorpio matchup. Scorpio and Pisces are two signs that are highly compatible. They connect in powerful ways on a physical intimacy front. They match strongly emotionally. They tend to be long-term. This is great if we want to talk about the 15 years where they were married. But if we claim Peter instead is an Aries, it it shifts a little. Aries Scorpio is typically an explosive match. This relationship is likely to be a cross between an X rated movie and a medieval battle. It will make you redefine the word intense. Hmm. So, this is the difference in the elements. Sounds like a super fun marriage. <laughs> With Pisces, these two signs work great. When you shift over a little, Aries doesn't have enough of that gel and it becomes uh, mm, not. A competition, like not many signs can match these two for passion or force of will, but this pairing can and will. Boredom is not going to be a possibility. Both signs are driven by a desire for more. In Scorpio's case, this is for more depth. For Aries, it's more excitement. 
but the couple will never fall into a lethargic codependency. I think Peter is more of an Aries, but let's continue. One nice day in 1952, Lily tells her mom, oh, I'm having tea with one of my friends, but really instead is taking off with Peter to Maryland to elope. I mean, we support eloping. We support eloping. That's a thing we support. They both say, fuck the high society wedding. Like these two are very different kind of birds, but flying to the same beat for a while. Right. Society is shocked about this elopement. Family and friends didn't even know that the two of them knew each other. Nonetheless, were dating. Like it was super quiet. After the elopement's done, Peter calls Robert McKim, Lily's father, and says, I've just married your daughter. And he answers, which one? Good Lord. Dad takes the news because Lily has three sisters. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But Mimsy, I mean, Flopsy, and Lily are their names. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. Mimsy, Lily is in the middle, and Flopsy. They have real formal names, but those were their nicknames all through life. Can't make the shit up. I mean rarefied earth you have got to be really rich for people not to just make fun of you when that's your nickname which one mimsy lily or flopsy okay reflecting many years later lily says my first marriage i mean i don't think anyone at least i didn't thought about what marriage was dr phil says you have to check out all these things nobody checked out anything in those days it was just my next adventure (laughs) yeah and if you look at these two like It is some sex appeal 100%. She is gorgeous and a free spirit, and he is gorgeous and charming, and like, they're like Tarzan and Jane. They are breaking the mold of what people, what everyone around them in their similar circumstances are doing at that time. Okay. Susanna Cutts, Director of Public Relations and Special Events at Saks in Palm Beach and a longtime friend of Lily's, Says about it, Lily was very young. Peter was drop-dead gorgeous and very charming and a real turn-on. She was raised in a very proper way, a very proper background. I think it was the forbidden, the exciting. Someone who was encouraging her to take a romantic leap of faith, to run away from it all. It all being the platinum spoon in your mouth. I was going to say, when you're this rich, there's no downside to doing whatever you want to do you always there's always a safety net but it's funny how yes that is entirely correct but it's funny how many of the individuals within this rarefied earth take such remarkably different paths without a doubt yeah yeah Yeah. no one of uh post's daughters like eloped and the marriage lasted 18 months. She was 19 or something when it happened. And like, there were rumors that E.F. Hutton had, dis- these were the daughters from her first marriage, but there were rumors that E.F. Hutton had disowned the daughter as a result. And he had to like walk that back in the press. Like, ha ha ha. I mean, we sure do wish we could have thrown them a big wet, you know, like it, it was very, you know, they had to be very cautious in how they, how they, because the press was ready to, right. To act like they were now outcasts and, you know, that wasn't the situation. But yeah, she left the husband 18 months later and like apparently laughed about her youthful indiscretion for the rest of her life. That's what you do. Well, I mean, these two are reveling in their outcastiness. Yeah. And so when you have enough money, you can be cool and be outcast. Yeah. They settle down in Palm Beach. They buy a cozy little clapboard house on Lake Worth. Hey. When I say cozy, please know the kitchen can seat 40. <laughs> these intimate little... Little places. Little gatherings. All these people find. They throw these legendary parties. Uh, Catherine Livingston, her biographer, explained the Pulitzer's turn of the century clapboard house was the place to which everyone wanted to go. Full of children, dogs, music, energy, and fun. I mean, that sounds great. Well, what they would do, everybody would be in the kitchen. They'd be cutting up and all making food together. And nobody fucking worried about the mess because after the mess, they would refill all the champagne bottles that were now empty with water and slosh it on the floor and have a dance party. Like, (laughs) that's that's incredible. I didn't add that in, in actual words to the story because of your dislocated shoulder. I didn't know if that would, how much that would hurt you. Dancing on a wet floor is 
dangerous. Yeah, but it beats dancing on vegetable scraps, right? That true. That well, they wash it all away, and everybody would just play slip and slide. That's how my mom got all of her floor floors waxed growing up in the kitchen. Is she'd put wax on the floor and give me and my brother and my sister like two or three pairs of heavily padded socks and go nuts. Uh, skate was, party, skate party. That's mm-hmm. exactly what mm-hmm. it was. Hey, handy tip, friends, for moms out there or dads taking care of kids. Anytime your kid says they're bored this summer, you just have a handy list of something there to do. I guarantee you will never have a bored child in your entire life. Handy hot take. Back to Peter and Lily. They do something very different than most of their set. They actually decide to live in Palm Beach year round. Right? Mm -hmm. Peter's established his orange groves and all kinds of local ventures, and they are really living an alternative lifestyle from the rest of their set. Uh, Lily has a pet monkey whose name is Goonie. When I first met Lily, remembers Laura Clark, who is Lily Spoon. Uh, She and Peter were the most gorgeous couple you ever saw, walking down Worth Avenue in their bare feet, Lily with her gold hoop earrings, They looked like a pair of gypsies. It was the time of the twist, and when they got up on the dance floor, everybody stopped to watch. Hmm. Peter Dushin says they were terrific together. They were very close. They were the kind of people who would do things rather than just play golf. Peter would fly into his orange groves. He'd work in the fields with the Seminole Indian people that were helping him and then fly back to Palm Beach and not go to parties. Like They are unconventional setting it breaking the breaking the mold lily has three children in quick succession three kids within four years and this is where i think of yeah yeah sisterhood (laughs) and vivi abbott because lily has a break one day she just falls quiet she later says she loved her kids more than life but the exhaustion and the boredom one of friend of hers puts it too many babies one on top of another and a whole new environment. She was a New York, Long Island girl, and suddenly she was here. In 1957, Lily suffers from nervous collapse and returns back up to a hospital in Westchester, New York, for several months of analysis and treatment. Her friends, in trying to smooth this over, say Lily's at Bloomingdale's to gloss it a bit. Ha <laughs> Lily bluntly later states she was in the nut house. She's like, I'm not glossing over that. Yeah. There's a, yeah, yeah. Forget that. In an interview from W Magazine, Lily says, I was not the most mature kid on the block. I had never had one responsibility in my life. My pea brain wasn't up to it. <laughs> the doctor said, there's nothing the matter with you. You need something to do. My marriage was driving me crazy too. And I didn't want to admit that even to myself. But I followed the doctor's advice and came out a lot stronger. And boy, does she find something to do. (laughs) It will not be what she is known for. However, this is yet another proof positive, y'all, that the universe is always conspiring in your favor. And any action is better than no action. Because doing something, doing anything, will get you to the next thing. Right. So Lily, in a move that shocks and horrifies... Palm Beach decides to head on down in her little station wagon and start selling oranges and grapefruits from her husband's groves. Oh, I'm sure this was. What on earth what are the hell you? Is Lily, Lily just got out of the nut house and now she's selling oranges out of the back of a fucking station wagon. And she's super rich and doesn't need to be selling oranges or anything. Like, you're selling fruit? <laughs> but I mean, let's talk about the resources you have on hand. So she's in her station wagon. She's selling oranges. She's delivering boxes of oranges and grapefruits to the finest homes on the island. And this is where the power of female friendships is everything. Sure. So you remember Lily's sister, Mimsy? Sure. And Flopsy. Yeah. No, this was Mimsy. Okay. She's friends with a gal named Laura Clark, who had been an editor for Harper's Bazaar up in New York City, the greatest city in the world, whose husband... Laura's husband, has recently been transferred to the Palm Beach area. And Mimsy is like, hey, why don't you call my sister Lily? And thus begins the start of not only a beautiful friendship, but a partnership as well. Again, I'll throw the link up for this from this Vanity Fair 2003 article. It's great. Laura Clark remembers Lily had been ill. Those eyes, not a pen she would miss. 
I saw a couple of things. She was doing an occupational therapy, her drawings. She could have been an artist. She had total command of proportion and scale and color. The doctor had said that she must not just sit around. He knew Florida. And what happens is you get very loggy and lazy. She was selling on the road. Peter rented a shop. I called Lily and said I'd love to meet you. So we had lunch and then she told me it made her very nervous every night when Peter got home from the Grove. He'd say, well, what have you done about the shop? And she wasn't into it. She'd never worked in her life and she had babies in the house. I said to her, this is no problem. I'll do it with you. That's perfect. And they become friends and partners. Laura says they were foxhole buddies. Nothing legal. like Nothing was legally written down at this point, but the bonds of sisterhood was the contract between them. So Laura and Lily are now out slinging oranges every day, making juice, hot as hell, cannot keep an outfit clean to save their lives in the swamp ass that is Florida heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here I'm going to take a tiny, tiny interlude and give a big shout out to one of the souls that has been in my girl gang for the longest time, my dear, sweet, darling friend, Amy. After 30 years of being friends, you know who your foxhole buddies are. Yeah. And that's Amy for me. We're catching up the other day, and Amy said something that really stuck with me. In our general musings about life and love, she makes the point to me that that to a lot of men, Women are just like spoons. They're useful when you need them, forgotten when you don't. They are utilities made to serve and then washed and put away until you need them again or they break and that's when you toss them out. So it's a very astute point to me. It seems so, yes. The opposite side of this to me when I reflected upon that is that women fucking collect spoons. We hang them on the wall. We cherish them. We want to look at vintage beauty. Like, you wonder about me sometimes. I have spoons from 25 years ago sitting in our drawer now that I won't throw away because... I, I have spoons from my childhood sitting in our our drawer. They're my spoons. This is why I go find old cast iron in thrift it, stores and old Pyrex, I mean, which you I do too. I just like, thought it was fitting. So Laura and Lily are each other's spoons. And this is, to me, the, you know what, you see a doctor, you get self-care, you start realizing there's a different thing, and then you find the value of that real friend, that one true friend, that you don't need no man. Like, it, I'm going to go ahead and make a new thing that's all on my own. She had every bit of money, power, wealth in the world. And it's like, no, nah, I think I want to do something just for me. And my friend Laura, because we like doing it. Sure. So they become orange juice magnates, correct? They're each other's spoons, and I think it's amazing. So genius strikes. Mm -hmm. Both of them, as they're out swamp ass oranges, right? Yeah, doing real work in the heat in Florida. They're bending, they're lifting, they're moving, and they're dirty at the end of the day. Each one of them has actually sent some colorful fabric to their own seamstresses. Lily rips some curtains off the wall. Laura is a little bit more refined. She's much more into designers, so she gets a a little bit better of a print. But they send this fabric, each swath of fabric, off to their own seamstresses with the instructions like, make me something cool and comfortable, but cute as fuck that I can bend in and move and breathe into and line it. Go ahead and put a lining in there because I don't want to wear underwear. I want to go commando. So they both come in like Monday morning to the Orange Grove stand. And if you're singing Bob Roberts Society Band by Jimmy Buffett, I love you and I need to know about it right now. They both come in Monday morning, Mm -hmm. one day, in these super simple tropical explosion dresses. They're like upside down buckets. When they spill juice and blood, like it's just going to blend. It's It's going to blend in. Nobody sees dirt, but they're super cute. They're sleeveless, like eventually some are with sleeves and some are without, but it's a, it's an upside down bucket. Like it is the simplest shift dress in the world in a bright and lively, crazy tropical, a mass of color explosion. And they both walk in like, what? You're my spoon, right? Yeah, Great yeah. minds think alike. That's very cool. So Laura, remember, has been an editor for Harper's Bazaar and is like, 
Lily, we are wasting our time out here slinging fucking oranges. I have an idea. So they head on over to West Palm. Shut the orange grove stand down for the day. Head on over to West Palm. They buy some fabric remnants and they take them to their dressmakers like, hey, make some more of these. They sell them each for 22 bucks on Palm Beach. They are sold out in no time. It is a fucking stampede. Young ladies, old ladies, it didn't make a damn. Everyone could wear this dress. It's a hole for your head, hole for your arms. But if you've had kids, you got a little bit of a bulk in the middle. It covers that. I have a few of these in my closet. I wear the fuck out of them. It's the dress that looks good on everybody. And if it's maybe not particularly your style, the pattern's cute AF. And F. I love the lily shift. Okay. Gotcha. These tropical day glow shifts are sweeping Palm Beach. Everybody has to have one. Lily puts in about 2000 bucks, and they're off and running. Laura and Lily never pay themselves wages. They just put the money back into the business, and they're both using their connections. Laura's using her connections up in New York City, and Lily's using her family and society connections. They find a printmaker down in Key West to make custom prints for them. Madcap renderings of a tropical free-for-all. Monkeys drinking martinis. Flowers doing the frog. I'm just imagining a a dude or woman in Key West, like, just smoking pot and dropping acid or mushrooms all day. Like, yeah, I, I got you. They have a pattern called this. the streaker, where you have, like, outlines of, um, like, it, woo! Color, whimsy, comfort, all collide. Gals go down to the Keys a lot. The fabric is happening. The prints are happening down in, the, in Key West. And the pilot on one of those trips forgets to refuel the plane. What? And has to land him in the water. So Laura what? takes off her lily shift. Oh, my God. And hangs it outside the window. And a oh. passing helicopter comes and rescues them. Because it's so bright. That's how colorful the lily shift is. You can wear them anywhere and feel great. And they invest in the lining of the dresses, too. Like, they're made for comfort. The turning point for Lily Pulitzer, even though it's she and Laura's company, happens in 1963 when Life Magazine does an article on the Lily. It also doesn't hurt that Jacqueline Kennedy is photographed in her Lily alongside her daughter Caroline in a matching shift for children in the same pattern as her mom called a mini yeah. named after Lily's daughter. Yeah, that wouldn't hurt at all a lily and a mini so there's jacqueline with her daughter lily pulitzer's all the rage they're also making men's clothes too there's a particular night shirt that lily christens the sneaky pete remember her husband's name (laughs) (laughs) in honor sneaky pete named Mm -hmm. in honor of yep peter pulitzer yep at the time he's kind of being shady af all of his, his friends are chastising him about his dalliances, warning him right and left, like, hmm. dude, don't do it. He's like, it's my life. But her work and his work and his dalliances are pulling everyone apart. Eugenia Shepard wrote of Lily and Laura in the New York Herald Tribune, their husbands might have been furious, but they ha- hardly ever saw them except to say good night and good morning. They're independent women. I mean, they're in the mid 60s. Let's talk about the feminist explosion. And I don't need you anyway. Yeah. Well, and they have basically limitless resources with which to pursue whatever they want. But they didn't need to borrow on those resources. They made their own resources and continue to invest them back in the business. It's incredible. So Peter's proud of her and they're enjoying as Scorpio and Pisces Aries do some healthy competition. Lily later says, Peter and I couldn't wait to get out the door. Let's see who can work the longest, the hardest. Lily, the eternal Scorpio holding it in, does not discuss anything about the sneaky Pete problem to anyone. Laura says she never said anything about it. She was never sad or mopey. Pete, on the other hand, when he's scooting out the door, is building hotels in Miami and Amsterdam as well, with the help of a friend and Cuban emigre named Enrique Russo, who managed to make a fortune in sugar in Cuba, but now that he's a Cuban emigre in the early 1960s, he needs a gig. Yeah, probably. I'm assuming he fled Castro. Yes. 
took his money. But he knew everybody in Havana, like right. a well-connected, moneyed family that now yeah, yeah, yeah. lands himself and, in oh, Palm Beach. Plenty of those people landed in Palm Beach. So, For so sure. he's got a network too. Okay. One day, just as quietly as they had eloped, Lily and Peter have quietly divorced. Their kids say there was never any fighting between them. It came as a complete shock. Wow. Laura Clark said they were leaders of the young group. Nobody knew what to do. You couldn't take sides because they were both so charming. Everybody was terribly upset. Like, it just, it happens that quick and fast. No muss, no fuss. It was as quiet as the elopement. I mean, it's fascinating that their children didn't even see the conflict. That's good for them. Good for them. So they divorced in 1969 after 17 years of marriage, three kids. Wow. But no one holds a Scorpio down because Lily uh, tosses her hair, checks her nails, puts on her shift dress, and uh, is feeling good as hell because the best part is about to start. Remember, Peter had been working with Enrique. Enrique, in addition to being a Cuban emigre, is humorous, well-connected, handsome as fuck, and dashing. Enrique has has a terrific accent. Oh, Mm. God, he's... No, he fights in the Bay of Pigs, and in the Bay of Pigs brings a tent, a servant. uh, Like, it is a very different sort of... He's in the thick of the things, but he's always a little cooler and more elegant right a little, elegant. Little, little bit separated from uh yeah from the riffraff now enrique has been married and divorced now twice to the same woman julia hmm. uh married twice they go on the outs and you know enrique needs kind of a place to live and moves into that clapboard house on lake worth with the pulitzers of course everybody denies that there was anything improper happening between lily and enrique But just like Lily's mama before her, Lily and Enrique marry just a few days after her divorce is finalized from Peter. Okay. They live happily ever after. Oh, well, that that is cool, actually. Enrique and Lily are married. Uh, He dies in 1993. And by all accounts, they live a terribly, blissfully happy life. Lily welcomes all of the family into her home all the time. She says, you can't get away from the family. You can run, but you can't hide. Hold on. Here's the Enrique's ex-wife, Julia, who he married and divorced and married and divorced, goes on to marry Peter Pulitzer's half-brother, Charles Armory. Okay. Well, I thought you were going to say Peter, which would have been... Oh, no. We have other stuff with Peter. This is not Shania Twain. It's pretty close. Okay, so over and over, friends, speak of holidays where Peter and his new family, because he does remarry twice, sit with his daughter's ex-husbands and their new families. No one is ever judged. Many, named after the mini dress, I learned how to be with my ex-husband by watching how mom and dad were. By all accounts, everyone leads a very happy divorced life. At least Peter and Lily and environs. But hold on. Let's talk about what happens with Peter. At least briefly. He is going to remain playing the field for a few years and then get married to a younger, peppy, not really from Palm Beach kind of gal named Roxanne. In 25 words or less, they divorce six years later after literally the trashiest divorce ever that has ever happened in Palm Beach. It was bad. Very bad. And for that, I need another hour, which we do not have on this platform, but don't worry. It's coming for you this week on Patreon. As my bonus trashy divorce for August, look out for that one Patreon peeps on Thursday or Friday of next week. I'll tell you now, the trashy divorce of Peter and Roxanne Pulitzer, you're not ready. Lily dies at the age of 81 in 2013. Her funeral is attended with all the ladies and men in Lily Shifts and Lily Prince. A colorful going out for a colorful lady. Peter, after a much-talked-about divorce, does remarry for the third time. He's married to that wife for 32 years and lives to the age of 88, dying just this past year in 2018. Hmm. And that is what I have on the Coconut Telegraph for the trashy divorces of Palm Beach. This week. 
Lou the Pulitzer and Peter Pulitzer. Although it does sound like they had a uniquely not trash. I mean, even their kids didn't know what was the what the problem was. I mean, that's. Like, if, do yeah. you want me to go ahead and do trash cans? Like, as trash cans go for this one, not very many. Not very although many. the ones I mean, they have are extremely colorful. Yeah, it sounds like he was cheating. Like, you know, blah blah blah. But. I mean, I want to go too. Like, there's definitely a case for adultery on his side. Maybe hers too. But also. Getting yourself into some intensive therapy and learning about self-care and how to make yourself happy and finding the beauty of a true and lasting female friendship, priceless. Hold on to your spoon, y'all. Showcase them on the wall. I don't know. This is low for me. One, one brightly tropical colored monkeys drinking martini trash can. Sure, sure. All right. You got, you got a bunch. I've got four. I mean, does it need, to, does mine need to go higher than one or are you? I, again, if their kids didn't know that the marriage was in trouble, then they did a great job limiting the trash can rating. Like, that's all there is to it. The Patreon divorce of Peter and Roxanne, the limit does not exist. I don't. Well, I can't wait to hear that one. No, it's a good one. But I'm going to go one for this. You're comfortable with that. Yeah, fine. Rock on. Okay, let's talk about. All right. Ed first. Oh, sure. Ed. Ed. I think they just married young. Her circumstances changed dramatically, and uh, I think she just wanted a bigger life than he was visualizing for them. So I give, like, one. I don't know of of any infidelity. I don't know. Like, they just, they got married young and grew apart, right? And wartime. Okay, yeah. Yeah. um, E.F. Hutton, though. My God, did she go to town on that guy. And she didn't have to because she was going to walk away independently. Like, Sure, it didn't matter, but... He just pissed her off. You're not even trying if you're fucking the maid. She had deep passions because he was the love of her life and he screwed her over. And she went after him. And so I... I like it. Four, four and a half? I'd go four, yeah, at least. Okay, let's go Um, four. Yeah. And then uh, number three, apparently they had kind of a tempestuous divorce, but I couldn't find contemporary right. I I think it was tempestuous between the two of them, but not in a press way. So uh, I I don't know, two, two and a half. Was he the one with all the stolen, the paid for stolen Russian art? Well, she, I mean, they, yes, that was Mm. that marriage. Um, You know, he thought stalin was a cool dude so you know let's give him three let's okay give, I, give i'm him three three just yeah let's up up that just for the stalin count yeah and then herb you know cavorting with younger men naked around the pool at mar-a-lago that's uh hold on was she cavorting or was he it was he he okay herb yeah um i mean i don't know you i i mean that kind of, well but somebody else saw it right like there was, it was basically a blackmail threat and Yikes. so I, that one might get a five. I mean, it seems like they did not part as enemies, but they, but like that could have been very bad at that time. You know, like that could have really been damaging to to both of them. I don't know if I'd go as high. I'd go three and a half on that. Okay. Like you already kind of thought he was gay. It's true. You have a good time. He's always going to dance with you. She was apparently really surprised to learn that one of her daughters had always known he was gay. <laughs> Like, I mean, it seems like she made some choices about what to see and what not to see. Consideration and I don't know. I could go three and a half. I could go five because whatever way you look at it, depending on your number of mimosas, I think that's a sliding scale. That's fair. That's fair. Three and a half to five, somewhere in that range. (laughs) How about that? Yikes. And that's the hot news on the Coconut Telegraph this week. Down on the islands, two Palm Beach divorces. Well, <laughs> five Palm Beach divorces. <laughs> it really was a lot. Yeah, no, uh, these are interesting figures. This world of extreme wealth is, uh, you know, I hope to get there one day. I'd love to know what it's like to live that way. We are never going to no know No consequences. What Come on. Well, can somebody tell us what an orange on a stick is? We'd love oh, to know. Yeah, that, yeah. Hey, in the meantime, go commando. Keep it trashy. Stay in the air conditioning, especially if you are listening to this anywhere in Europe that is currently being melted by yeah, the sun that's or whatever. The truth. And if you belong to a private club that is just leaving ketchup bottles on the table and not putting the ketchup into a dish, find a new private club. Plastic squeezy ones, too. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Our best trash candy friends. We can't wait to come back to you next week for the beginning of August in one of my favorite Leos. Y'all aren't even ready. We'll see you then. Keep it trashy. Stay in love. 
and stay in your shifts. Bye. Bye. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, and you can find more from her at sydneyvsmith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find out more about Ratsy at Ratsy's store on Instagram. Want to check out our sources, soundtracks, or other notable episode information? Visit trashydivorces.com. On the web, you can enjoy early ad-free releases, regular bonus stories, follow-ups, and more by joining us at patreon.com slash trashy divorces we have merchandise available online too get your trashy divorces gear at bit.ly slash trashy merch and thanks to what a maneuver for doing such a great job with our cloths hey we appreciate all of your ratings and reviews if you do leave us a five-star review on itunes send us a little picture of it let us know and we'll ship you some trashy divorces stickers and such anywhere in the world we got you because holy cat y'all we're now in 125 countries 125 countries and counting thank you for listening thank you for telling your friends thanks for being awesome you can send those emails for your free sticker swag to trashy divorces at gmail.com and last but not least check us out on social we're at Trashy Divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs, Twitter, which I, Stacy, mostly run, and on Facebook, which we pretty much split. We also have a Trashy Divorces discussion group on Facebook if you want to chat with other Trashy Divorces listeners. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Keep, Keep it, it trashy. trashy.